looking at the bouncing ball example again, we're now going to look at it from the perspective of you know what can we what can we imply from or what can we what implications does this have in a philosophical sense? <clears throat> so let's first of all look at the original example to start with, because that is bizarre enough as it is. You're looking at a ball that stops bouncing within a finite amount of time, having executed an infinite number of bounces. Now, you know, you might think, fair enough, but, but think about that. The problem with that is, from an intuitive perspective, that after 8.25 seconds, when you look at the ball, you'll see a stationary ball. If the ball has stopped bouncing, when did the last bounce take place? Well, the thing is, there's no such thing as a last bounce. There is an infinite number of bounces, so any bounce that the ball executes is always followed by another bounce. So how can a ball have stopped bouncing? But the maths is indisputable. It doesn't lie. The ball stops after 8.24 seconds. At 8.25 seconds, the ball does not bounce. <clears throat> so, your intuition, as straightforward as it seems, would be simply and absolutely wrong. Your and what you need to get your head around is, is that it's your intuition that's at fault here, not reality, not the reality of the situation. Um, and with reality, I mean the reality as described in that particular model. The model itself is abstract, it has no bearing on our physical reality, it uses an outdated form of physics, but as an abstract model, and given that model, working within that model, the math is accurate and the conclusion is, the conclusion is inescapable. And that presents us with this intuitive hurdle to overcome. And the only thing you can do in that case is drop your intuition and accept the reality of the mathematical model. But let's make it even absurder or even, even harder to get your head around. Let's flip the situation around and present you with an even weirder mathematical model of a, ba a ball that is found to be bouncing and you observe the ball bouncing and you see and you realize that every time the ball bounces it bounces twice as high as the previous bounce and you measure the latest bounce and you find that the latest bounce reaches up to 10 meters now the math is actually identical to the previous example, except it's backwards. So what you will find is, when you work it out, is that that ball started bouncing 8.24 seconds before that measurement was taken. And now what does that mean? It means that by the time you take the measurement, the ball has already bounced an infinite number of times. And yet, it started bouncing 8.24 seconds ago, and there was no such thing as an initial bounce. Now again, intuitively, you balk at this. I have no doubt intuitively you'll balk at this. But again, the maths doesn't lie. Now, I'm going to take this one step further. And I'm going to take it outside the mathematical realm. And of course, I have now no math to support my following statements. However, now we've seen examples, contrived as they may have been, of these counterintuitive things. It is no longer possible to simply dismiss an idea 
because it feels intuitively wrong. So let's now look at a chain of cause and effect. Now, I did watch a video made recently by M. William Zero in which he disputed the whole idea of cause and effect in physics. And that is a video well worth watching and he makes very valid points of it. So, accepting that, but putting it to the side for the moment and working from an assumption that there might be something like cause and effect in nature because he didn't exactly say like there most definitely isn't a chain of cause and effect he just says in no current physical theory does the concept actually exist so there's no reason to believe it does but let's still just let's just assume it does let's say there is cause and effect we then go back to the original argument made about existence of God and it was basically Thomas Aquinas' argument and it goes something along the lines of every effect has a cause but you cannot have an infinite chain of causes and effects and I now have to draw attention to that statement because that is no longer so intuitively clear. When you first hear it, your intuition says, yes, that makes sense. But now I've given you an example, an example of where that seems to make sense, but it actually doesn't. So, let's look at this reverse bouncing ball example again. and. Imagine a situation slightly different from bouncing balls, but where there's something similar in operation where every effect is twice as large or twice as big as its originating cause. Then you can see how there could be an infinite link of effects and causes going, going back an infinite number of causes however only spanning a finite amount of totality, whatever you want to call it. Now, as you can see, I've, I've kind of strayed out of the mathematical arena and into a sort of philosophical arena, but because we can think of a mathematical construct in which an infinity of things is spanned within an envelope of something that's finite, we can no longer dismiss the idea that there could be an infinite chain of causes and effects. Not only that, but looking back at the, at the original bouncing ball example, where basically the ball starts bouncing, but without an initial bounce. And if there's no initial bounce, you could imagine that there needs to be no such thing as a triggering event or in the, ca in the case of Thomas Aquinas' sort of idea of movers and prime movers and all that sort of stuff, it suddenly removes the need for something like a prime mover. You can have a link of effects and causes going all the back, an infinite link back to within a finite amount of time, for example, to the start of the universe, and there being no such thing as, a, as an initial starting requirement or trigger for the universe because it just spans an infinite number of things and therefore doesn't require an initial event and therefore doesn't require a trigger or a prime mover or a god. <laughs>